requires the so-called savage <coughs> with whom he may do violent battle as his other. In his uh, recent and very illuminating book, and I could recommend this book to you, Anthony Vidler, it was published in 2008, uh, a book titled Histories of the Immediate Present. Anthony Vidler provides an illuminating discussion of the historiography that would eventually be enlisted to support modernism. And um, Vidler makes three very interesting points. He argues that the historians who want to write about modernism, to support it as a movement, had to think along at least three lines. Firstly, modernist history and theory had to demonstrate the fundamental antiquity of the past. Secondly, modernist history and theory had to construct narratives of the prehistory of modernism to show how it had emerged from that past. And finally, according to Widler, modernist history theory had to redraw a notion of progress via a repertoire of formal and spatial motifs. I think it is helpful here to return once again to Foucault's essay, Nietzsche Genealogy and History, because uh, Foucault locates the assumed promise and authority of progress in the principle of the emergence, that is, the moment of arising. And he, he says, I'm quoting Foucault, emergence is thus the entry of forces, it is their eruption, the leap from the wings to center stage, each in its youthful strength. And then he follows with what I believe is an insightful critique of the emergence, a critique of the progressive posturings of, pro of progress. No one is responsible for an emergence, no one can glory in it, since it already occurs in the interstice. In a sense, only a single drama is ever staged in this non-place, the endless repeated play of dominations. Hence, for Foucault, progress ironically involves a repeating of the same and a renewal, a renewal of a traumatic drama. And I, I honestly believe that those are truly wise words from Foucault. And I think that our recent past in fact, bears that out. Um, because I think we, full, we know full well the failed and conflicted utopias of, of the modern, and indeed of the postmodern also. So, in summary, uh, then, we have this pair of limit conditions, limits of the origin and of progress both of which have forcefully impressed upon architectural history spelt with a capital H, transforming the flux of time into a, a fully determinant teleology of events. Although potentially innocent on their own terms, these ideas of origin and progress have inevitably twinned with grander theses, resulting in a disturbing form of blindness and, and an inflexible law of force. Also, at first glance, we might assume that the origin and the notion of progress are opposed. For where the former pushes back into the past, the latter projects into the future. But I, have, I hope to have shown that this is not necessarily so. For on the contrary, we may observe that the force of the origin and the flight of progress are made for each other. This is so because the projection of progress requires a break from the past, and that break is invariably captured through the determinate logic of the origin. And in which case, history, spelled with a capital H, of the origin and of progress, is nothing but the circularity of narcissism. Sorry guys, I'm actually going to say that again 
because I think that's a, a really uh, one of the lines I'm, I'm, I'm quite proud of. So <laughs> I'm going to roll it out for you one more time. In, in this case, if, this is, if what I've argued is true, then history spoke with a capital H when applied to the origin and the notion of progress is nothing but the circularity of narcissism, whose real interest is to preserve the, the perspectives of the present. Okay. Okay, so I would now like to uh, move on to my third and final section of the, my talk. Uh, where I want to consider history in the lower case and, um, and the contemporary scene in historiography. And, um, you know, just basically to recap, I think, I, I hope to have shown that history is a constructive body of knowledge about the past, that history doesn't just, doesn't just happen, it gets written, and that um, the narratives and methods and convictions that produce history have changed through time, which also suggests that we can write a history of history. So, now, this is a topic that interests me hugely, as I'm sure you have gathered, the history of history. And uh, just as an aside, you might think that uh, given that history is speculative, you might think a history of history is even more speculative, more speculative still. Oddly enough, I don't think that that is the case. Because when we write a history of history, we can, st we can study the narrative. And the narrative is the thing that, in a sense, is more objectifiable and more immediate. When we do a history of history, we don't need to worry so much about what the history is of. Because we're not writing about that. We're now writing about how history itself has been written. And uh, anyway, I, I, I want to get to the question of the contemporary scene. Uh, in, in his geography, but I want to do that by approaching through uh, Michael Podro's very interesting account. Uh, Michael Podro wrote this book, The Critical Historians of Art. It's an excellent book I would recommend to, to all of you. And um, in this book, uh, Podro is studying German art historicism from the period 1827 to 1927. And he argues that there were three stages in the development of art historicism in Germany. And I, I, I find his argument incredibly compelling. And uh, even if it isn't correct, I think it's interesting to go through these three stages because I think they help us to understand and they bring, bring richness of understanding in terms of where we are today. So please bear with me. The first stage, according to Michael Podro, he says it occurred where alien art was accommodated only as a deviant of, or as a precursor to the writer's own norm. And he cites Winkelmann as an example of this type of history. In other words, a normative commitment in the present was used somewhat inflexibly to judge the art of the past. So I think building on this, we might argue that uh, a commitment to an aesthetic tradition, one that is deemed to result from a continuity through time, uh, is a variant of this approach. It is one that results in a present reenactment of a pastness of the past rather than a fully fledged conversation with the past. The second stage, according to Podro, issues from the philosopher Hegel and the critical art historians that followed in, in the wake of what Hegel innovated. And this, um, this stage occurs when historians become more aware that their past is not our future, uh, our, our present, sorry. Our present is, 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 is not their past. And furthermore, that there are different pasts. And, and, and soon as we acknowledge that there are different pasts, we then, we, we, we have to introduce uh, different norms, different aesthetic norms that are associated with each past. 
And this then introduces the difficult question as to how is the art of the past knowable? Because we're, we're admitting our way of understanding art is not the same, necessarily the same as their, as their way of understanding art. And, and the difficult question comes in as to how their art is knowable on its own terms. And Potro explains that uh, this question was addressed to the critical historians uh, through the assumption that there was some trans-historical property to art, and that art itself could let us into that transmission of, 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 of normative understanding. Okay, then the third stage in, in the history of art, according to Potro, uh, is, is associated with the writings of Panofsky and various others. And this is where a general conception of art was constructed of which particular arts were seen as modes of manifestation. In, in, in other words, <coughs> art history now serves to demonstrate particular aspects of a supra theorized conception of art. Now, reflecting on this three-stage uh, progression, I think we notice that there is an increasingly philosophical conception of art, just as there is an increasing appreciation for the relativization that occurs amongst different artistic periods and different artistic norms. And actually, Podro is all too painfully aware of the problems that start to emerge uh, as we continue this trajectory. Because obviously, we are embedded in our own history, and we can never really escape the embedded condition of our historicity. And actually, at the conclusion of his book, Podro uh, introduces a very interesting idea, one that he thinks can extend the critical tradition, but answer to its shortcomings. And that is what he terms a multiplicity of viewpoints. That we can now experiment with art history, and we can try to explain it in, in different ways. Um, and I, I think that's more or less what we've landed up with today, for better or worse. I think that's more or less what we've got. In recent years, I believe we've entered a new stage, that of an aesthetic nominalism. And by the term nominalism, I mean the idea that if we're going to theorize art in its biggest sense, then there's actually very little we can say, because we want to preserve the maximum possibility for many different types of art. Okay. Um, I believe that we've entered a new stage, that of an aesthetic nominalism, or if you prefer, a quasi-nominalism. We are aesthetically nominalist today in that we enjoy the Beatles while shopping at the mall. We relish a radio broadcast of Mozart on our way home. And we pour over a book on Baroque architecture while sitting in our Miesian minimalist interiors as the Sex Pistols blast delightfully from the stereo. <laughs> and we accomplished this, I believe, because in our time we have witnessed a near total emancipation of the aesthetic domain, the effect of which is almost impossible to resist or to escape from. The position of an aesthetic nominalism comes in precisely when we attempt to theorize art and for that matter, all forms of human creation in its entirety. A theory that now needs to run the full gambit from Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel to Duchamp's urinal, from Albanoni to Zappa, from Alberti to Zaha Hadid. And quite frankly, there is little we can assuredly say in our attempt to capture the deepest awe of it all. Universalizing assumptions as to the essence of art appear to retreat from us. And in exchange, we soon discover that particular aesthetic theories and formulations are better suited 
to the actual qualities of works. Hence, we witness a proliferation of different aesthetic ideals to match the equal proliferation of imagination. Which is also to say that aesthetic theory has been rendered partial and open-ended and indeed experimental for the, for the most of us today. And this aesthetic nominalism, or if you prefer, the context of an expanding plurality of aesthetic values, parallels the new historiography of art. Namely, the trend widespread today to replace art and architectural history spelt with a capital H, conceived as a separate and autonomous field with a more culturally staged set of histories, plural, and in the lower case, H. Uh, histories set within and around the production of art and architecture, and to do so through focused studies that are richly led and attentive to issues of uniqueness and difference. Because, in truth, everything about the architect, her life, her work, her patrons, her clients, as well as the reception of her work, everything here of importance also belongs to cultural history and to society at large. But which is not to say that interpretive theory and aesthetic theory are no longer valid. Actually, quite the contrary. Aesthetic and interpretive theory is as important as ever. Only now theory gets more pragmatically aligned to the particularity of the case. And the turn towards more culturally specific, micro and detailed histories of art and of architecture result in part from what philosopher Francois Lyotard has called our incredulity to meta-narratives. And I think that by and large, we do approach sweeping uppercase histories with a big wallop of skepticism today. But here's the catch. Sorry, there was a catch. Okay, there's a big catch. And this is, this is the big point. I'm nearly finished, folks. This, was, this is the big one. This is the point I was wanting to get to all along. There's a catch. Just how long is a piece of string? Where do micro-narratives cease being implicated in macro-narratives? Where's the elusive cutoff point? Where is the threshold between the macro and the micro in the narrative construction of history? Actually, we cannot answer that question. And so I think that Keith Jenkins is correct when he wishes us to see that the critique of historical construction, which is how we started this lecture, if you remember, the distinction between empiricism and realism, that the, 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 the critique of historical construction applies every, mitch, every bit as much to history in the lower case as it does to history in the upper case. And if this is the case, and I in fact think it is the case, then we are forced to see that lowercase histories are every bit as ideologically implicated as their uppercase partners. And so, in actual fact, we're forced back where we started. And I want to quote this passage. I'm very nearly finished. I've only really got two more points. This is one and then there's another point. I want to quote this uh, passage from Jenkins. He says, For to argue, as lowercase practitioners do, that the study of the past should not have anything to do with being present or future-oriented, is, of course, exactly as present and future-oriented as the argument that it should. <coughs> Uppercase historiography is generally quite explicit that it is using the past for, say, a trajectory into a different future. The fact that the, the bourgeoisie don't want a different future means that it doesn't any longer need a past-based, future-oriented fabri fabrication. Thus, at this point, the point where the links between the past, the present, and the future are broken, because the present is, every, is everything, the past can now be neutralized and studied not for our various sakes, but for its own sake. This notion of own sakeism that 
that we, we, we sit here, we're severed from the past, we can just leisurely look back at the past in our armchairs and comment on it for its own sake. It's, 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 that's bourgeois history. That's what it is. For this is exactly what is currently required. A history that is finished now that it has led right up to us. Thus to pretend to be present-oriented is precisely what constitutes the present-centeredness of the lower case. Okay. And for my closing remark, I just want to say that I think uh, we've landed up in a wonderful position. That's, that's actually my opinion of all this stuff. I think we've landed up exactly where we wanted to be. That's really what I think. Because you see, when we put architecture as a creative practice alongside history, which informs our understanding of architecture, I think we can now say that we've settled the score between design and history. Because both academic history and the practice of design are deeply embedded in the flux of time. And both wish to give expression to thoughts, to desires, to feelings, and, and to material interests. <coughs>